So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I am Aline Pacheco and together with Malila Prado and Patricia Toski Lux, we are going to support our colleagues who are presenting. Before we start, just a quick reminder regarding our webinar. We have two speakers who will present on the same topic and we will leave the question and answer period to the end of their presentation. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and it will be directed to the presenters later on. We kindly ask you to keep your microphones muted, but you can leave your videos on if you're comfortable with that. Also, the webinar material will be available at the, uh, the IKEA's website shortly. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce today's presenter. Ana Lucia Tavares Monteiro is an IKEA board member and co-leads the IKEA research group. She has been working with the ICAO language proficiency requirements since 2005 at Anaki, Brazil, as a regulator, aviation English test designer, interlocutor, rater, and rater trainer. Anna has an MA in Applied Linguistics from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and a PhD in Applied Linguistics and Discourse Studies from Carleton University, Canada. Her research interests include the impact of cultural factors on pilot controllers com uh, controller communications and the specification of the construct of aviation radio telephony communication to inform test design. Angela Carolina de Moraes Garcia is in her first year of the PhD program in Applied Linguistics and Discourse Studies at Carleton University. She has been working as a language test developer and rater's trainer at the Brazilian Civil Aviation National Agency, ANACI, since January 2008. Angela holds a master's degree in language testing from Lancaster University. Her research interests include English for specific purposes and language testing, especially aeronautical English testing, validity, reliability, construct definition, and rating scale development. Actually, the five of us are from Brazil and we are all members of the IKEA Research Group and also members of AGEA, Grupo de Estudos Inglês Aeronáutico or Aeronautical English Study Group in Brazil. It is a pleasure to have you all on board. Before we start, we are going to launch a poll in order to find out some more information about our participants today, okay? So I will be launching the pool right now and okay is that available to you yes now we can so see here it. we yes all right then so uh we have here a few questions so to have an idea about your background question one where are you located now question two what, you, what is your main job role? <clears throat> Question three, how familiar are you with corpus linguistics? And question four, did you attend the last IKEA webinar on using corpus linguistics to create tasks for training two weeks ago? So please let us know. And that's great, we have 82% now. All right. Good. So 92%, is it okay? So let's, and then I'll just, I'll read the results to you. So where are you located? We have 37%, 23 people are in Europe and 19 people in South America. Okay, so 30%. We have 10% in North America, 11% in Africa, 13% in Asia, right? 
And uh, regarding question two, so about uh, the, the, the main job role, we have 56 percent, uh, uh, which corresponds to 35 people who are aviation English teachers or trainers. And then coming in second, we have 21 percent of 13 people who are aviation English test raters or interlocutors and uh, 6 percent aviation English test developers and uh, 6 percent other uh, as well. 5 percent are researchers and the 3% pilots, we have two pilots and two air traffic controllers, right? Question three, how familiar are you with corpus linguistics? So 33 uh, people claim they're quite familiar. So that corresponds to 52% of the audience. And the uh, 30% not very familiar, 19 people. And the 16%, 10 people very familiar, okay, 2%, one person uh, says never heard of it. <clears throat> and uh, lastly, question four, did you attend the, the last uh, IKEA webinar? So uh, we have 40% saying no, I did not attend the webinar and I haven't yet watched the video recording. Okay, so 29 people and the uh, 43% uh, uh, say they have attended and the uh, 11 uh, percent, seven people say no, but I have watched the video recording, all right? So, and uh, here, no, okay. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Patricia, you have the floor. Okay, well, thank you, good day to everybody and thank you for joining us today. So I will start. Okay, so for those who were uh, here with us in the last webinar and for those who were not, uh, we will start with a flashback from the previous webinar. So if you remember, we proposed to create a collaborative aeronautical English corpus to do um, an aeronautical English corpus together. So we named it Aero Corpus. And in the previous webinar, we showed the steps for compiling a corpus. So there were five steps. Uh, and if you didn't see it and would like to see it, you can watch the webinar. It's available. Okay. So we invited everybody to compile to find one or more communications find the transcript or transcribe it, fill in a chart with the transcript and information from the text, and then save it at Padlet, at a link that we showed you. And then we had this two week challenge. So two weeks ago, we invited everybody to uh, be with us in this project together. So now let's see what happened today. We have the results. Ta -da! So here we have, uh, thank you very much for all the collaborations. We are very happy. Uh, we have many collaborations, many people joined us. Uh, as you can see here, most of them from Brazil, but also from other countries like uh, from Argentina, Canada, the UK and Ireland, uh, from Poland, from Qatar, Madagascar, China, Japan, so all over the world. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. So for the people who collaborated, for the people who sent their transcripts and posted here, where you can see the pins, for those people, today we will share with you, as we promised, we will share the corpus, okay? So we organized all the material and we are going to send the corpus for those who collaborated. But if you haven't collaborated yet, we will give you another chance. Okay. Move on. Okay, so it's another challenge, okay? Let's see how many people uh, can uh, can participate with us again in the next 15 days, okay? 
So let's see how many scripts we can have by November 24th. The link is the same, okay? So you can come back to the same link, it's the same link we had before. And we will share uh, today with you in the chat. Again, we are gonna share the template so that everybody follows the template and some guidelines for posting. Uh, so during this two weeks, some people had some doubts or some questions. So based on that, we prepared like a tutorial, okay? And we are going to share that with you, but not right now. Uh, because we don't want to spend a lot of time on this. My friends have a lot of interesting things to tell you about corpus linguistics applied to testing. So uh, now we're going to stop this topic. But in the end of the webinar, we will uh, share this template and the guidelines, okay? And if you have questions, you can write your questions in the chat and we can answer them in the end of the webinar, okay? And again, we will put together all transcripts we get collaboratively, and then we are going to share them all with the people who participated, okay? So, as I said, we are going to share today this first version of the Aero Corpus with the people who collaborated. And in the next 15 days, we will collect new contributions. So it's our chance to join this project and after that, we will share the version two, the second version of Aerocorpus, hopefully with more contributions with the people who participated, okay? And it's very important for you to send us an email, okay? So if you have questions or if for any reason you, didn't, uh, you, you don't receive uh, the corpus today, just send us an email, our emails for the five of us are displayed in the last slide of this presentation. So uh, contact us and we will send the corpus, but only if you participate, okay? If you join us, okay? So that's it. Thank you. And now I'll hand over to my friend, Ana Lucia. Thank you. All right, can you see my screen right now? Okay, good. So last time, last uh, in the last webinar, right? We, we talked to you about uh, corpus linguistics and how to use it to design uh, tasks for training purposes, right? To help teachers uh, in their tasks of preparing teaching materials. So today we're going to discuss the usefulness of corpus linguistics to language testing and assessment. Right, And we all are also going to present some applications of corpus linguistics to task design in the assessment of pilots and air traffic controllers. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I got stuck here. Can you still see my screen? Yes, it, does it, did it change? Mm, yes. Okay, all right, sorry. So um, first, we are going to, to give you some definitions. Anna, we are not seeing the presentation. Just the uh, it's not it's, it's, the presentation hasn't started. You should yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. So we are going to uh, show you some definitions, and from the literature, we are going to present uh, usefulness of corpus linguistics to language testing and assessment. Uh, you, you will see that you can use it in different ways, in different phases of the test design process, test development process, but we are going to focus on a specific uh, um, step on test design and we are going to, to, to emphasize uh, our focus in this presentation. And also we are going to highlight the importance of construct specification before designing tasks. So we will uh, discuss a little bit of this in relation to speaking and listening. And then we are going to uh, show how we applied results from corpus linguistics analysis to design to the design of tasks for listening tasks and for speaking tasks. And also we're going to emphasize the importance of working closely with SMEs, right, in this endeavor. And finally, we are going to present some conclusions and share with you some useful references. 
So we selected here uh, a definition of corpus linguistics from our colleagues here, right? So we decided to quote uh, Prado and Toski Lux because they um, presented us in, in, this, in their paper a very simple uh, definition of corpus linguistics, which is defined as a research method which employs corpora for, uh, sorry, for data extraction and also a definition of corpus. What is a corpus? A linguistic corpus is a bank of texts stored in computers, which allow for a semi-automatic extraction of data by using statistical analysis. So if you, you can uh, later on go to, her, to their paper and you are going to find out uh, more definitions of, uh, from corpus linguistics, right? And also, uh, other uh, reference, useful references in this uh, field. Well, corpus linguistics can be useful at, at all phases of test development and validation. So we selected some uh, aspects here and we went for Cushing, Sarah Cushing, and, and she explained that uh, the, one of the value of uh, corpus linguistics is that it allows for comparative analysis. Uh, of different types of corpora. So we can, you can compare specialized corpus versus a more general uh, corpus, general language corpus. So with that, we can um, go for domain specification, right? If you want to, to specify um, a, a domain of uh, language use, we can go for construct specification, construct definition. And also uh, we can, uh, it helps us to design tasks that authentically represent a, a specific field of language use, a target language reuse domain. But also it's possible to run comparative analysis between a learner corpus and an expert user's corpus. So we can uh, compare the differences between how learners um, uh, communicate to expert users, but it also allows to, uh, it, it gives us the possibility to identify uh, some features that distinguish different levels of learners. And this can be helpful, right? For um, rating scale development, for example. And also, we, we also have test performances corpus. And with that, you can uh, run comparative analysis, you can, um, identify or investigate the effects of task variables, for example, on test performance. And it can also be used for uh, rating standardization and, and many other uh, uh, steps during the test development and the, the ongoing validation of, of tests. So uh, in terms of uh, task and item, in item design, right? So this author, she emphasized that language testers can check intuitions against empirical corpus data. So uh, instead of relying on intuition and you, you can go to the, to the real communication, right? And investigate things so that you can make decisions about what features of language are very important at different levels of proficiency, or you can check the prevalence of certain error types for creating plausible distractors for multiple choice questions or other features of the language that can help you to create distractors. You can also identify features that make listening or reading texts more or less difficult. So these are ways that results from corpus linguistics analysis can help uh, in task and item design. And of course, for rating scale design uh, based on the close analysis of learner language. So there are many ways uh, you can use corpus linguistics. And we also uh, selected here another quote from Taylor and Baker. They add that corpora of language test content, which is another type of corpus from the input of the test and of test taker performance from the output of the test, the, the, the test takers responses, right? They provide language testers with important archives that enable them to address key issues. So if you use uh, corpus from the input of the test and also corpus from the output of the test, you can compare uh, different test forms. You can use it uh, to uh, 
as, uh, assist you in greater training and standardization, and also for standard setting and maintenance of standards over time, and investigation of test bias across different test taker populations. So when we talk about corpus linguistics and language testing and, and assessment, you see that you can use different type of different types of corpora and also different types of analysis, depending on the phase of the test the development process that you are on, right? But okay, our focus here, we're not going to talk about the whole test design process. We are not going to talk about test validation. We are going to focus on task design. And we are going to use a specialized corpus from expert users in order to inform the design of test tasks and items that authentically reflect the target language use domain. And what is the context that we are referring to? We are referring to the professional context of international aeronautical radio telephony communications. It is a very specialized context, as we know, very technical, and it is a professional context as well. So I included here uh, two references about scholars, important scholars in the field of language for specific purpose testing. And also uh, we have a, a, we had a, a recent publication in the field of language assessment for professional purposes, right? So they, they assist us a lot with the theory and also guidance for practice in that field. So before talking about task design, right, uh, we, we should consider uh, steps in this process that come before the task design. So it's important for us uh, first to, to move from models of language use, theoretical models of, um, that explain to us what it means to know and use language. For example, the communicative competence model. We also have the intercultural communicative uh, um, competence model and all the current notions of um, language use in this globalized world, which include, for example, English as a lingua franca, which is something that we talk a, a lot in our field. So when we move, uh, we move then from the models to the frameworks and we select aspects of the construct of this language use that are important and relevant for, for our context, for our domain, and also very important to the decisions that we need to make uh, based on the test scores. And at this level of the frameworks, we need to ask three important questions, right? The first one is, what complex of knowledge, skills, or other attributes should be assessed? So what is the construct that we need to assess? Then we ask, what behaviors or performances should reveal those constructs? And then we move, okay, now what tasks or situations should elicit those behaviors? So we should uh, think about these three things in order to design a task. And later on, we would move to a third step, which would be the writing of test specifications, task specifications, which detail a specific task, task and a specific test. So uh, for us to, to uh, highlight uh, the need for construct specification, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to show and share a, a very briefly with you two studies that uh, emphasize on construct specification. So part of my doctoral research was on construct definition, right? And in this study, it is an empirical study that I conducted. And I, I designed the matrix using um, subject matter experts and, and domain specialists, right, to, to conduct this study. And uh, one of my uh, out outcomes, one of my results was this matrix of construct specification for the aviation radio telephony domain. And I'm showing here this matrix, right? So we have four domains. I included aviation English, English as a lingua franca, intercultural awareness, and also interactional competence across four different uh, dimensions, awareness, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. I just highlighted here some features, some components of the construct from the interactional competence um, uh, domain or, or this part of the, the, the construct because it's, it's going to be useful for our, our discussions today. 
So the importance of the participants being aware of communication as a two-way negotiative effort, it's not just one way, communication is two-way. Also, the process we go through to solve communication issues when there is a problem, a communication breakdown, knowing how to move on to solve these problems, and also skills to deal adequately with misunderstandings by checking, confirming, clarifying, using communicative skills, interactional skills, and also the, the need for cooperation and flexibility in this context. I'm not going to go into detail here, but you can uh, you have the reference at the end of the complete study. I would like uh, also to, to, um, to share with you one definition of interactional competence. In the last webinar, uh, we showed you, we shared with you another definition from Galaxy and Taylor, but today I decided to provide you with one from Young, and they, all, they are all scholars in this field of interactional competence, and he says that uh, interactional competence refers to the pragmatic relationship between participants' employment of linguistic and interactional resources and the context in which they are employed, and how this uh, is related to, to how the, the way those resources are employed mutually and reciprocally by all participants in a particular discussive practice. It, it can be a, a, a long definition, but it it's very useful and I think it's complete. And, and he also uh, tried to say this in other words. So interactional competence is not what a person knows. It is what a person does together with others. So in the moment of the, the, the interaction. So another uh, study that is important to highlight. So my colleague Angela Garcia, she conducted a, a, an empirical uh, study in her first year of her doctoral research, doctoral study. And uh, she decided to investigate what needs to be assessed in relation to the listening performed by pilots in radio telephony communications with the air traffic controllers. So, and recently she published a paper with Dr. Prof, um, Dr. Jenna Fox uh, about this, uh, about her results. So she explains how she undertook, how she uh, designed her study, the use of SMEs as well, and her findings. I'm going to highlight here some of those findings in, uh, related to the construct of listening tests. So. One of them is the, the need to understand main ideas, to recognize words and numbers, to understand both plain English and phraseology, to extract specific meaning from both short and long transmissions, to understand messages that differ from what was expected, and to use strategies in order to understand. So it's a really interesting paper. I strongly advise you to go there and check this, this uh, reference. So last time we also mentioned John Field. John Field is an expert in, in, in this area of listening comprehension. And he gave a webinar this year. And it's very interesting that he mentioned that listening as an equal partner in the conversation is much more cognitively demanding than, for example, listening to a recorded conversation. Right, so when you're just listening to a recorded conversation and you don't need to interact at the same time, it's less demanding than if you were talking as a, a partner in a conversation, in a real interaction. So it requires much more cognitively and you need other skills. So he emphasized that the lexical search and parsing, they, they play a, a, an important role. So the participant, the interlocutor, he needs to tag pieces of language in her uh, short-term memory to link their next utterance to the one that you're hearing. So it's not just a, a matter of uh, processing uh, and producing your utterance, but it has to be linked to, to what came before. And also this happens as well at the level of meaning construction. So it's important to recognize the intention of the speaker, to interpret pronouns, to infer information that has not been explicitly, explicitly mentioned. And this happens under extreme time pressure. So these were his words, John Field's words in his webinar. So real time pressure to construct the next utterance. So, and, and I think that this was really applicable to our context, right? Because when we talk about pilot controller communications, we're talking about 
an interaction that moves on under extreme time pressure. At certain moments, uh, the pilots and controllers need to give immediate responses. All right, so what was the methodology that we used? How, how we, we decided to uh, organize what we did to show you? So first, the corpus that we, we used is CORPAC, the same that was mentioned last uh, in the last webinar. Uh, it's a, non it's a, a corpus of non-routine events, a specialized corpus. It's not a learner corpus, right? So it's a corpus from a real uh, radio telephony communication between pilots and controllers. So Aline Pacheco, has just uh, uh, prepared a paper on that to explain the corpus, uh, explain uh, CORPAC and, and, and the benefits of using a corpus like this. So it's forthcoming. So stay tuned for that publication as well. And based on this corpus, uh, we used a software, uh, which for us, it, it was very user friendly, which is Wordsmith to run concordance analysis you can run word lists, you can run um, word lists, concordance, and uh, I forgot the other one, but we are going to see in a minute. So, uh, and for this, uh, for the purpose of this uh, webinar, the analysis we run was based, was using, we, we selected the word confirm. And this was because, this corpus is from non-routine events and we wanted to check the strategies. We wanted to find uh, uh, instances of interactional strategies when it was necessary to check, confirm and clarify and the type of information that was required uh, to be confirmed or clarified and also the context in which they appeared. So to show you very briefly how we, we conducted that, we recorded a, a short video, right? That shows this um, software. So we can run concordance, uh, a, a concordance analysis. We can also find keywords and word lists. So what we did, we selected Concord. The next step is to uh, search for the file that we have our corpus, which was CORPAC. So we need to include the file. We select the file, it's a TXT file. And then we select the word that we are searching that you can change the words, you can search for other expressions And then we can move from the results of the concordance analysis to the scripts. <coughs> and you'll find the instances that we are looking for. And we found very interesting and, and many different instances of requests for confirmation and clarification in different scripts. And these were very useful for us to move on to our next step. So in total, using CORPAC, we found 48 instances of confirm or confirmed or confirming, right? So it allows us to find all these three variations. <clears throat> And 13 of them were from the same transcript. And that's why we decided to select this specific transcript for our um, tasks, right? For our uh, job of, of designing the tasks, okay? So now I'm going to hand over to Angela. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for being here with us. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. 
Okay, so as Anna was saying, uh, we chose this specific transmission that had uh, 13 occurrences of uh, confirmation messages. And uh, we created some tests, just as you know, examples for you of how we uh, can use the corpus to create test tests. So we created uh, two types of tests. Of, uh, the first one was uh, listening tasks uh, uh, in isolation. We are testing listening in isolation. And then uh, the, the two first tasks are just uh, testing listening. Uh, We're going to talk about uh, other types of uh, communicative, uh, testing listening in a communicative context. But we also have some uh, tasks that are kind of in the in between both, they have listening, they're focused on listening, but we also, we can also assess speaking at the same time. Um, so let's start with the listening uh, tests. The construct that we want uh, to measure, construct is what, what do we need to measure? So uh, when designing tasks, we all, always have to make it clear that we don't just, uh, create tests of you know, nowhere. We, we need to know that that's very important know that, to know what are you testing? What, what do you want to assess? In this case, uh, we want to assess the ability to recognize words and numbers, understand main ideas, and to extract specific meaning from both short and long transmissions. Our goal was to develop test tasks that require pilots and air traffic controllers to understand transmissions, including handings, distances, emergency situations, clarification requests, etc. Uh, so we're going to start with four different uh, task types. The first one is uh, table completion. The second one is a multiple choice question. Um, uh, the, the third one is the, uh, report, the, the candidate needs to report what happened. They're going to listen to a, a transmission and then they just talk and report everything they could understand from the transmission. And the fourth one is similar to the third one, but they, after listening to the transmission, they answer questions to explain what they understood. So, uh, we, on the right side here of the screen, you can see the original script. Uh, I'm going to play it for you. So, uh, you know, you, you, I'll, under, I'll explain to you why we had to change it. But first, let's listen to it. understand what they're saying. The quality is not very good. Uh, so we decided to uh, re-record it. Um, 
we recorded it again. Uh, but before I play the, the next, you know, the adapted script, I wanted to show you here the, the question that we developed. Uh, it's a table completion task. Uh, the task taker is supposed to fill in the, these spaces here. Uh, the information that they're supposed to write there are uh, highlighted here in green. And of course, we're not going to talk about marking here, but uh, the, the multiple choice question has the advantage of being no easy to, to mark, but they're difficult to create, but easier to mark than qu uh, questions like this. They're more challenging uh, because there might be different options. For example, uh, I don't know, the pilot's initial request to air traffic controller. Uh, it's right here. Uh, America 2493. I clicked here, sorry. Uh, they, they might answer exactly how it's written here, but they might use different words, paraphrasing. So if it's the computer that's going to mark the test, the, the test developer needs to make sure there are many different options, uh, or they will need a, a, a real person to mark the test. So let's listen to the, the adapted script. Uh, it's very important uh, to have it recorded by subject matter experts because you know, they know how to communicate uh, in this context. And also, uh, no, we have to clean the, the original script. You know, we, we changed the call sign and they, they need to, uh, speak very clearly, you know, the important parts of the, the transmission that will help, you know, will to help the, the task takers to identify the important parts that they need to uh, include in their answers. If in the original uh, transmission, those parts that you want to test are not very clear, it would be you know, much harder for the test taker. So let's listen. America 2493. Unreadable, please say again. Mayday, mayday, mayday. America 2493. We need vectors to the C4 ditching. We need to avoid trees. American 2493, unreadable. Confirm you need vectors to land or to dump fuel. America 2493, vectors for ditching. Ditching. The aircraft is uncontrollable. We need vectors to ditch. American 2493, roger, sir. In that case, you can fly to Miami International, fly heading 260. We need vector into the sea, please. We will be ditching. Ditching. American 2493, fly heading 260. Heading 260, American 2493. American 2493, please request vectors to the ocean. Please, we will be ditching. Aircraft is, is completely unstable. American 2493, you have the river. If you turn by the left or right, heading 260, it's the closest thing. Heading 260 for the river, American 2493. Maybe the ocean, is it too far? American 2493, the ocean is 40 miles from your position. Okay, please request back to the river. American 2493, left heading 260. Uh, left heading 260, American 2493. So see, this one is much better, right? Um, other things that we can improve when we record the, the transcript ourselves is uh, if there are any mistakes regarding uh, phraseology or anything that might be confusing for the test taker, for example, in the original script, uh, the pilot, no, the controller asked, confirm you need vectors, something like that, to land or to ditch fuel. So that would be confusing for the test taker. So we changed it to dump fill instead, okay? Uh, okay, so that was the first type of test. Now the second, uh, as I 
said earlier, the multiple choice questions, uh, we would get you know, the same script. Of course, I, I need to make it clear, clear that these tasks are all, we, we use the same transcript. So just to show you that we can create different tasks uh, based on only one uh, transmission. Of course, we're not going to use the same tasks in the same test. We need to vary, you know, have different you know, vocabulary, different situations. This is just uh, a demonstration, okay? So uh, the candidate would listen to the same uh, recording and then answer these questions, these multiple choice questions. And it's important to highlight that uh, the corpus is very, very helpful uh, because when we are creating a, a task, uh, ourselves without you know, getting inspired by the corpus, it's really hard to create uh, the options, the dis distractors. And here, everything that's written, that, that's highlighted in green, we, we took from the corpus. So the corpus helps us to, to create the, the distractors. Um, it's also very important to make sure you create items, you no know, options that are approximately, you know, the same length. Uh, and uh, of course, something that is silly, but uh, you have to make sure that the option is fully correct, that the correct option, uh, because, and that there's not another option that would uh, also answer the question. So th there are many tricky things uh, that you have to keep in mind when designing multiple choice questions. Uh, so this is another example of uh, a test that we could create based on the, the corpus. Um, now, the third type of question, this, the, the, the two first that I talked about were testing, listening in isolation, and now we're going to start involving some speaking in the task. Uh, we, chose, we chose this uh, specific, shorter uh, transmission here. Uh, the original text is on the top, for pack 43. That was the original. And then we adapted it. We changed some things. But you can see that what's in green uh, was taken from uh, the core pack. So you, you see, it helps so much. That's what we want to emphasize, how helpful and useful it can be. Uh, and we adapted, we included you know, the call sign and the, the, con the control Miami approach. Um, so that's, that's the recording that the test taker would listen to. And then we have two different tests. One, uh, the task three, is that they just listen to the recording and then tell the examiner, the interlocutor, in their own words, everything they understood. So they would need to, uh, the, this one is for those of you who know our Brazilian test, the Santos Dumont English Assessment. This uh, task is very similar to our part three of the test. That's what they have to do. So we are testing not only you know, listening, uh, but also the ability of the, the test taker to paraphrase. And uh, we can also then, as the, the candidate is, is speaking, we can also test uh, you know, pronunciation, grammar, fluency, and so on. Uh, the other option would be to ask uh, the test taker to listen to the recording and then instead of asking them to report in their own words everything they understood, the, the interlocutor could have a script, you no know, questions asking about the, the recording, like what was the reason for the mayday call, what was the pilot's request to deal with the situation, and so on. Okay. Uh, now the speaking tasks, the, the tasks that are a little bit more communicative. The last one is the role play. That's the most communicative one. Uh, now the construct that we are measuring is the interactional competence, uh, the ability to deal with apparent misunderstandings by checking, confirming, and clarifying a very, very important 
uh, skill that you no know, pilots and air traffic controllers need to demonstrate. Uh, our goal was to develop scenarios for test tests that require pilots and air traffic controllers to confirm or clarify information or instructions. So we have two different test types. Uh, one that we were uh, inspired by our Brazilian test for civilian pilots, the Santos Dumont English Assessment Part 2. And uh, the second task is a role, a role play for air traffic controllers. Anna and I are not used to creating uh, tasks uh, that aim at testing air traffic controllers, but we made an effort. Let's see what you think. It's hard, you know, sometimes to put ourselves on the other side of, you no. Know. <laughs> uh, okay, so just so you, you know how our part two works, I got this uh, example from the modern version that's available online on Anax website. Uh, basically, uh, the interlocutor tells the, the test taker that uh, he's going to listen to five different recordings. This is just one of them, one situation in our test. There are five different situations and they have to interact uh, as a pilot. They have to interact with the air traffic controller as the pilot, but it's not a, a role play. They are going to listen to recordings, okay? Um, and they, they are told information such as, oh, you are a pilot of a twin-engined aircraft. Uh, your call sign is an ANAC-123. Um, you are allowed to take notes if you want to, information like that. So uh, then uh, the, the interlocutor introduces you know, the context of the, the first situation. Uh, this example is, you are going to land at Frankfurt Airport, listen to Frankfurt Center and read back. And then uh, the, the test taker listens you know, to this first recording. And that one, two, three, traffic is overtaken, descent to flight level two, nine, or zero. And then the test taker needs to read back. For example, uh, uh, Frankfurt Center, and that one, two, three, traffic overtaken, descent to flight level, descending to flight level two, nine, or zero. Okay. Then the interlocutor. Uh, introduces uh, an abnormal situation, something that was not expected. Imagine you have just experienced a rapid decompression. Call Frankfurt Center to report the situation and say your intentions. Um, there are some disadvantages in this no test format because here the, the interlocutor is giving the, the test taker the vocabulary, rapid decompression and so on. Another way of doing this, and what we do that in our test, we have, as I told you, five situations. In three of them, um, the interlocutor just tells the candidate what the situation is. But in two of them, the, the interlocutor only shows a picture to the test taker. So they need to come up with the vocabulary themselves, okay? So the test taker needs to interact with the air traffic controller reporting the uh, the, the, they're experiencing a rapid decompression, they report uh, the situation and their intentions, and then they listen to another recording. And that one, two, three, descent to flight level zero, nine, or zero. I understand you had a loss of hydraulic pressure confirmed. And then the, the test taker needs to uh, confirm or clarify the, the, the information they heard. In our test, we have, uh, it's divided, maybe sometimes two confirmations and three clarifications, sometimes two clarifications and three confirmations. And we tried, we, we have some versions, and we tried to create uh, uh, tests that uh, sometimes that same situation they have to confirm that the first part of the, the, the situation is the same, and then the second part can change. Sometimes they need to confirm, sometimes they need to, to clarify. After uh, interacting as the pilot, they need to answer the examiner, uh, they need to answer the question, what did the controller say? Just so we test uh, listening a little bit further, because sometimes they, they hear things that don't need to be read back. 
So they, they end up reading back those, not, not reading back, uh, letting us know that they understood that part, that piece of information when they answer this question. What did the controller say? For example, well, I don't know if there are, there's the wind information about the wind that doesn't need to be read back. Uh, things like that, then we we test, we, we see that if they understood it or not when they answered this last question. Okay, so we tried to create uh, a task based on the corpus, the same transmission, adapting to our part two. So, <clears throat> sorry, uh, we created no two options to, to uh, set the scene and the context. Uh, on the left, you can see the, the transcript, the original. Uh, you can try to create the, the, the test based on the same trans transmission. That's our second option. But you have a, a lot of other um, situations and transmissions in the, the core pack. So you can mix, you know, uh, get some uh, information from other uh transmissions as well it doesn't need to be you know exactly the same so this was this first option in, in, in the original option and the, the original transmission the pilot was uh ha had just taken off and now uh we're imagining a different situation that the pilot was about to land at miami airport so we see the the other airport i think it's lisbon and now it's Miami, we changed you know, the phase of the flight, we changed the airport, and we got uh, inspired by another transcript, transcript number two. And that's so helpful. Uh, I've been working as a task uh, designer for you know, 12, 13 years, I think. And it's so hard for us, uh, English language uh, experts, ELEs, to create tasks uh, uh if, if we don't have a subject matter expert of course smes have to uh revise the tasks that we create we have to try them we have to do all those you know important steps but the the court the, the corpus helps us a lot with uh, all these you no know, technical uh information that we need to include in the the recording so this was the first uh, option. Uh, you're going to land at Miami Airport, listen to Miami Approach and read back. Uh, Anak 123, turn left, heading 270, descend and maintain 10,000, expect ILS Approach, runway 09. See, it was, it's the same thing uh, that was written, it was uh, from, the, take, it was taken from the, the second transcript. The second option would be to uh, rely on what was already uh, in the transmission that we have been uh, using for all the tests, that's the transcript 43. Uh, you're flying from Lisbon to Cairo, climbing after departure. Listen to Lisbon approach and read back. So that's the context. And it, it's good to, to, uh, to inspire to, to get information from the original uh, trans transcript because uh, you don't need to worry about things like uh, oh, is this uh, heading or is this uh, flight level something that it would uh, be given in the in that airport by that uh, air traffic control because uh, or a runway, for example, runway 09, is that, uh, we don't need to, to research to look for it, it just, it's written there, so it's right, right? Uh, of course, you know, runway numbers change from time to time, it's always good to check, but it's, all, it's already, you know, very helpful that the, this technical information is already there. So, uh, Anak 123, turn left, heading 060, climb and maintain 4,000 feet. Um, okay, now the interlocutor, uh, the, 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 of course, the test taker would read back, and then the interlocutor would come up with the uh, complication. 
Imagine you have lost control of the airplane and decided to ditch the airplane in the sea. Call Miami Approach to report the situation and say your intentions. Um, this is not re regarding the first option, of course, Miami. Uh, so we, we have created two different options. This is, uh, we, we could create uh, confirmations and clarifications. First, the confirmations. We, we took from uh, the core pack two different possibilities of confirmation. Uh, the controller could say, an app one, two, three, descend to 2,500 feet, QNH 1010, confirm you wish the sea and not the river, or an app one, two, three, descend to 2,500 feet, QNH 1010, confirm you'd like to proceed for a ditching over the sea. Both uh, sentences were taken from the, the car pack. So it's, the, we, we, uh, those of you who work as you no know, test item writers know it's so hard uh, and it, it made our lives so much you know, easier just taking that information from the, the corpus. So I, I, I hope you find it useful too when you create your test tests. Um, so regarding the second uh, possibility, uh, the, the clarifications, uh, the same, no, the same, uh, imagine you have lost control of the airplane, same thing. And then instead of listening to confirmation, to something that the, the, the pilot will need to confirm, he may listen to something wrong and then they need to clarify. And I want to three descend to 2,500 feet, QNH1010, confirm you wish the river and not the sea. We just changed the position here. And now instead of confirming, the test taker would need to clarify. Or confirm you need vectors to dump fuel over the sea. So we also took that from the carpet. So do you see uh, how easier it, it makes uh, for us to create uh, tests? Okay, so this is how it would be uh, after uh, the, the, we put it in, in red just because it's the first option. It could be the, the second option too here. So there are many options, many things that you can do. Uh, in our test, of course, we don't have you no know, two different options. We have uh, to confirm two confirmations and two clarifications. We, you, we usually you know, just choose one of them. Uh, one confirmation and one clarification, uh, and for no different test takers, of course. But we wanted to include all, all of them here, just so you know that it's easy. It, we, we, take, we take the information from the corpus. Now, the, set, the, the last kind of tests, the, the last test that we created, um, this is the most you know, communicative test. Uh, that's what John Field was you know, talking about as unexplained. He has this webinar about you know, testing interactive listening. He says it's very, very important to test uh, listening uh, while speaking and in a real uh, conversation, not only you know, listening to a recording like part two. So far, we don't have that kind of a task in our sensible English assessment task, but we are uh, planning to have it soon. Right, Anna? Okay, uh, so the information. Uh, I, I'm going to give you some information about the task and then I'm going to play uh, because we, we did this with a friend who is an air traffic controller. And first, uh, we explain the context. Uh, then the, the test taker would listen to a, a short transmission between a pilot and an air traffic controller. Uh, we're not going to assess that listening. It's just that the listening is just to contextualize. Ana Lucia has... Uh, sent you in the chat box the script if you want to, to open it and follow uh, while I play. Uh, so they listen to the, the contextualizing you know, transmission and then they have to continue, okay? They have, the, the listening starts 
and then the, the controller, that's the task taker, <coughs> will interact to an interlocutor um, for some time. And after uh, the, this transmission is over, uh, the, the, another interlocutor can ask questions regarding you know, the, what happened. In this uh, role play uh, that we recorded, uh, the, the candidate first talks to an ELE. Uh, the, the ELE sets the scene and plays the recording. And then uh, a, a subject matter expert rater would do the, uh, the role play. And then the ELE would ask the questions. So it requires you no know, two examiners. Uh, because it would be really hard for the ELE to uh, interact with the air traffic controller, no playing the role of the, the pilot. So let's listen. You're going to listen to a short conversation between a departure controller and the pilot of Diamond 453, who is experiencing some problems. When the recording finishes, you will take the role of the air traffic controller and interact with the examiner who is going to play the role of the pilot. Ask and answer questions as you would in real life. At the end of the role play, I'll ask you some questions. Departure, Diamond 453, uh, request maintain 4,000 feet, present heading. Diamond 453, 4,000 feet, approved to Q&H 1010. Diamond 453, we're experiencing some flight control issues. We're having trouble maintaining directional control. I'm on 453, Roger. Advising tensions when able. We'd like to continue on this heading while we run some checks. I'm on 453. I'm on 453, Roger. Turn right ahead in 220. We're unable. We're having problems with directional control. Stand by Diamond 453. Diamond 453, request return to Lisbon. Diamond 453, descend to 2,500 feet. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah. Oh. Sorry, guys. Page 1010. Negative. We need to maintain 4,000 feet. Diamond 453. Diamond 453, Roger. Maintain 4,000 feet, QNH 1010. And report when ready to proceed to Lisbon. Diamond 453. Diamond 453, unreadable. Please say again. So, until now, it was just the listening and uh, the conversation that the, the test taker needs to listen to. Now, the test taker starts interacting, okay, with the subject matter expert radar. Diamond 453, request heading towards the sea for ditching. Diamond 453, say again, advising Mayday, 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 Diamond 453, heading 030, 4,000 feet. We've lost control of the flight. We need vectoring to the sea. We plan to ditch in the sea. Diamond 453, confirm, you need vectors to land. Are you visual with the airfield? Negative. We require vectors for ditching. Ditching, the aircraft is uncontrollable. We need vectors to land on the sea. I say again, we plan to ditch in the sea, Diamond 453. Diamond 453, understood. Fly heading 260. Heading 260, Diamond 453. We are unable to maintain directional control. We need vectoring to the sea, please. We will be ditching, Diamond 453. Diamond 453, fly heading 210. Heading 210, Diamond 453. Diamond 453, uh, our aircraft remains unstable and we are unable to maintain directional control. 
request vectors to the sea. And just to confirm, we will be ditching. Diamond 453, there's a river closer to your position, the River Tagus. On your present heading, you can ditch where it's about four kilometers wide. If you can fly heading 200, I can guide you towards the river. This is closer. Copied, heading 200. Um, we'd prefer the ocean. Is it far? Diamond 453. Diamond 453, the ocean is four zero miles from your current position. Okay, in that case, we'll ditch in the river Tagus. Request vectors Diamond 453. Diamond 453, understood. Turn left, heading 200 to the river. Left heading 200, Diamond 453. Okay. Now the Yali would ask questions. Listen. Now answer some questions about the situation in the role play. What was the emergency the pilot was facing? Uh, the pilot said he was having control issues and he lost the directional control. And what did the pilot request? He asked for vectorings to the sea. He wanted to ditch. He asked for a May Day, or, or that is, he declared emergency. How did you, as the controller, try to help the pilot? Well, I looked at the maps and I gave him options, and I found that there was a river closer to him that he could ditch into the river. And how important was it to confirm the pilot's intentions? It was very important in order to proceed with the following steps. So if I was, I needed to make sure he was ditching into the water. So I would ask for the right assistance. Mm -hmm. Have you ever faced a situation like this? Actually, yes. Uh, once a pilot lost um, knowledge of what level he was, he wasn't sure. So I asked him to fly as high as he could to reach a level where there was no traffic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's the end of the role play. Uh, just a quick uh, explanation. The listening part needs to be recorded by subject matter experts. Uh, we, we have to thank all those who helped us. Anna is going to mention that at the end. Uh, it's good to add uh, some sound effects, no, a background noise uh, to add some authenticity to the recording. If the pilot is talking, you can add some background noise of uh, an engine, uh, or if it's the controller, background noise of a control room, no controllers talking in the background. Um, the examiner, the, the one who is going to play the part of the pilot needs to have some guidance with him. Uh, what am I going to say next, uh, depending on what situation? But of course, this guidance cannot be uh, set in stone. It needs to require some flexibility because uh, it depends on what the controller is going to say. If the controller says something that is not written in the script, the, uh, it's a, a live role play, so the, the pilot needs to uh, you know, be flexible and respond according to what he heard. Uh, the role of the pilot needs to be performed by a subject matter expert who is knowledgeable to adapt his responses and questions according to previous utterances. And the prompts uh, to test taker uh, needs to be given somehow, maybe using a computer screen with the diagrams and the maps on the screen or, or cards with relevant information know what what do you need to request or what do you need to say okay uh pictures can also be used so that as i said pictures don't give the vocabulary they just see what they need to talk about and they have to use their own vocabulary well um that's it now anna please over to you for the conclusion Oops, sorry. <clears throat> before, before we mention the conclusion, um, I'd like to launch another poll, if I can manage this 
thing here. Um, just a second. We have another poll to launch. Just two quick questions for you. Can you see it? Okay, so we are getting some responses. <clears throat> so lots of people have already used real aeronautical communication to create tasks for testing. And good to see that a lot of participants are, you know, likely to use or to consider using corpus linguistics in the materials they develop either as teachers or as test developers. So we are getting to 85, 86%. All right, so I'm going to end the poll. Yeah, so the majority of you have already used real aeronautical communication to create tasks for testing. And good to see that uh, the majority of participants uh, are very likely to apply corpus linguistics. They will do this very likely. So this is, is good to know, right? Uh, a few, only one, unlikely, some possibly, and others quite likely. So, okay, good to know that. I, I think that um, we hope that our uh, webinar uh, gave you some, um, inspired you to, you know, to apply this, this resources that we have. So to wrap up our presentation today, so the first thing we wanted to show you is to present the usefulness of corpus linguistics to language testing and assessment, right? How you can design tasks based on the construct. So go back to the construct uh, in terms, we used here, we emphasized here interactional competence, interactive listening, right? But it's very important to uh, depart from the construct that you need to measure. And then how you are going to build tasks to assess this construct. And also we showed how we can identify features of the construct in transcripts of real communication using corpus linguistics analysis. So this helped us a lot to identify those in the real transcripts. And also we can create different types of tasks. And we hope that with these examples that we showed you, we are able to notice that we can create non-interactive tasks, somewhat interactive tasks and totally interactive tasks. So the, the role play, which was the last one, is a, a, a task that we assess extended and interactive communication. And also, uh, and here we, en we emphasize the need to adapt the script uh, to create a task input. So we can create not only the task input, we can create the questions based on the scripts and we can also create options or distractors for multiple choice uh, questions, for example. And just a reminder that our colleagues made last time uh, that corpus linguistics is not prescriptive. It is descriptive. It describe, describes the language that's used in real life. But for this reason, we need to work closely with an SME, right? We need to extract what is good from this transcripts of real communication to adapt to our needs. So we need to ident un unidentify the scripts we need to remove uh, a certain expressions that are not according to standard procedures. So the, the, the presence or, and this engagement of the SME is very important, right? And, and finally, uh, 
we, we wanted just to, to finalize saying that for us, uh, we, we noticed the value of using corpus linguistics uh, for training, to design uh, training tasks, and also for testing, right? It can be a bit more challenging for testing. We need to be uh, more careful. We need to exercise a lot of caution when we design uh, questions for testing, right? But it, it is possible. We, and we felt that the, with the use of corpus linguistics and all the analysis that it, it offers us, it was possible to create tasks for tests. Thing, and it makes our lives a, a bit easier. So here uh, are the references that we mentioned in our presentation. We would like to share, it may be useful for you. And we'd like to thank you. And we'd like to thank all the SMEs that work with us. So we had four Brazilian SMEs, three pilots that helped us with the recordings, with the transcripts. So I'd like to thank Edmilson Vaz, Gabriel Gregorio, and Henrique Helms. And also we'd like to thank uh, our colleague, our traffic controller, uh, Ana Graziela Mendonça, who helped us to record the role play. And a special thank you for Michael and, and Neil Bullock from uh, IKEA, who also helped us with adapting the scripts, with um, uh, editing the sound files. So a big thank you to you all. So, you know, it, we just want to show that it's a, it's a teamwork, right? We need to be uh, to work as a team in order to prepare um, uh, good and appropriate tasks for testing purposes, right? So thank you very much. Now, um, I think that now it's it's a time for questions. Yes, uh, so we have some uh, five minutes uh, to answer some questions. And uh, if you have any question, please uh, write it in the chat for us. Then I can read them to our uh, participants here. Um, before, uh, in the meantime, Patricia, can you please talk a little bit more about the the, the location, the pin of the the map of the Aero Corpus? Sure, and uh, I can see that there is a question about, could you please cl clarify an email to send audio scripts to add to the corpus? Well, so our idea is that you don't send the audios by email to us, but that you use the Padlet uh, app that we are using that is, uh, I will, I will uh, put it here in the chat to the link to the Padlet. But uh, please try to use the Padlet. And in the beginning of my presentation, I showed you the map with the contributions. And um, sometimes people pin in a place on the map, but don't leave any contribution. So you are not going to receive the corpus just by showing up. Okay, you need to leave your contribution there. You need to prepare at least one transcript according to the five steps that you can see on the documents we have just shared here with you. We have just shared three documents about Aerocorpus. One is the template here in the chat. One is the template so that you can fill in the chart with your own information. The other one is a model so that you can see an example. And the other one, as I said, is a guide with many information about it. Um, but if you have questions, if you are not sure how to do it, you can email me. My email is in the end of this presentation. Or you can email any of uh, the five of us and, you, and we will help you. Okay, it will be a pleasure for us to help you, to give you more information. Okay, so uh, we would really like to have people contributing at the Padlet. But if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Now, uh, so I'm interested in applying, Long Paris, yes, sorry. I'm interested in applying Corpus Linguistics for Aviation Mechanics, for Aviation Maintenance Technicians. Here, the language skills are more focused on reading the manuals and bulletins and writing prescript entries in the maintenance log. Any thoughts about gathering the data to create the corpus linguistics for reading text and writing logs? Can I answer? Sure. <laughs> yes, we already have uh, an ongoing project happening in Brazil today with uh, the, I, I don't remember her last name. Uh, 
at uh, if scar Dani Terenzi Daniela Terenzi Daniela Terenzi exactly Daniela Terenzi so she's uh, coming up with a corpus uh, of uh, aircraft maintenance manuals oh, and uh, she's here where is she <laughs> okay Daniela can you <laughs> where are you can you please join us can you answer that question where is she? I cannot see her. Well, that's a surprise. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a camera here. Okay. But that's fine. yeah, I, I have a project to compile a, a, corp a corpus for a mechanic so we can use it to, to develop materials and to perform other kinds of research. So it's a project for next year. So uh, if uh, the person uh, wants to be in touch with me, I can give uh, uh, my email so we can be yes. in contact and talk about it. We can share her email address with you. Yeah, yes, sure. And there is also another person here, Claudia Elguerra. She also works with technicians, so she can collaborate with you. So it, it's another person that we can get in touch with. Yes. Maybe Daniela okay. should you, post her, uh, her article, the it link may... to her article here on the chat. Yes, Daniela. That's true. Good idea. An article idea. about. Oh, She's just thing. written her email address there. Okay. Yes. And uh, also, there's another question here about Aerocorpus. Uh, let me just scroll up a bit. I lost the quest. Okay, here. Uh, if it's. Uh, what about. If we use the, if we use aerocorpus, non-standard phrase for non-standard phraseology uses, if if this would be useful. So, yeah, actually, uh, the idea is to bring uh, scripts of all kinds of situations, emergency situations, non-standard phraseology. So, if we have uh, situations when pilot and controllers are using plain English, it would be even more interesting for us, for our purposes. Yeah, I would just like to, to add that um, using plain English, instances of plain English is very interesting for us to have, to research, to search, right? But uh, if you have examples of wrong phraseology, we need to be careful with that, right? And we need uh, to be careful when we use this information from the corpus to build our tasks, especially for test tasks, right? So it can be, uh, it can help if we have a mix of plain English and phraseology, which is what happens in real life, right? But we need to be careful if we have a uh, uh, wrong use of standard phraseology and not use this in our tasks, right? The, when designing tasks, just to be careful. Okay, so well, we have some emails here so we can exchange them. This is going to be another project. Look, maybe yeah. another webinar. <laughs> maybe, yeah. So. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, we can see many, Thank many you so much. Great.